Welcome into our Cubs Recap Podcast, a presentation of our Recap channel here on YouTube and available audio only wherever you get your podcasts with my partner Gordon Whitmire at GW Cub. I'm David Kaplan at The Capman on Twitter. All right, Gordon, the Cubs off to a nice start. They beat the Mariners last night. They took two of three from a good Texas Rangers club. Uh, yesterday, an extra inning walk-off win. Nico Horner with the game winner, his first walk-off of his career. By the way, so, had a great game. And that was just that a was great a baseball game. game. Yeah. And the best part of the whole game, besides getting a W, the obvious, the lights at Wrigley are awesome. $3 million worth of new lights. I'm not sure I like going to a disco when I go to the ballpark, but all right. It's nice and bright, and you can see. So give me your take. Here we are taping this on Tuesday morning in advance of game two tonight, Cubs-Mariners. Again, I think the Cubs are what I expected them to be. 81, 82, 83 wins if they're healthy. They don't have a huge margin for error. Starting pitching solid. Bullpen pretty solid. They've got to get Say Suzuki back. Looks like he'll be back Friday in L.A. Look, I think we both thought Texas was going to be a pretty good team coming into the season, maybe one of those surprise teams. And they beat them two out of three, so I give them some credit there. They didn't face DeGrom, right? Now, they beat Milwaukee in the opener, beat Corbin Burns, uh, but then they lost the next two games, and, and we see how good Milwaukee is, right? They split with Cincinnati in a couple of games, and they, and they beat the Mariners in 10 at, at first game in. I don't think they've been truly tested yet, Cap, and, and we'll see. I mean, so they're sitting right around 500 right now. That's good. That, a game over. That's great. They've got 10 out of 13 starting Friday against the Dodgers and the Padres. We'll know a lot more at the end of that two-week stretch, um, and, and maybe they'll hang in there. If they hang in there and they're right around within a game or two of 500, um, you know, I'll start giving them some, some serious credit. Uh, for what they're doing. In terms of right field, they did make a roster move uh, with Nelson Velasquez coming up. I think some people thought it might be Christopher Morrell, but Velasquez is off to a really good start in AAA. So you reward guys who have earned their way up. Uh, I was surprised that they, with Suzuki out, had to play Master Boney as much as they did out there. I truly believe getting Suzuki back is a massive upgrade for this lineup. Do you concur? I think it's a serious, I think it'd be a notable upgrade, no doubt. It'll be a noticeable upgrade, I think. We'll see what he what he's doing. But right now, I suppose he's looking good in the rehab. And, uh, you know, he'll be sooner rather than later. So uh, I do think that's good news. I, I do think, uh, I, look, I'm looking forward to seeing him during this regular season after what he did in the off season. Um, we didn't get a chance to see him basically at all in spring training. Um, but he supposedly lost weight or put on good weight, replaced bad weight with good weight and, uh, was, you know, was really in great shape, you know, best shape of his life, I think is what they said in spring training. But, uh, I think what they're doing, you know, Bellinger's had a couple of games now. Hosmer looked all right the last few. Um, love what uh, the guys in the middle are doing. So you get him and plug him in if he's productive. By the way, Ian Happ, too. Um, and it does lengthen your lineup quite a bit, and it stabilizes your, your defensive lineup, too. So, yeah, I do think that's, I do think that's notable. Okay, in terms of what you've seen from them defensively, uh, I thought there was a play in the Monday night game against the Mariners where oh, Dan fielded the ball yeah. almost behind second. Why the base runners take it off to try and get to third, I don't know. And he made a hell of a throw. Oh, I know why. A dart. I think you're you're 100% right. Um, but uh, – I give Dansby Swanson more credit for that than I give the base runner an F for base running. Uh, my first reaction was like yours, like, what an idiot. What's he doing? And then I saw the replay again and was reminded where that ball was hit. A lot of these runners are taught, you know, yes, you don't go second to third when the ball is hit to the shortstop unless it's 
to your, as you're facing the plate to your left. If that shortstop has to field it going towards second base or towards center field, that's when you would take off. If he's on that other side of you. Um, uh, I know Dave McKay taught that form of base running when he was with the, the Cubs. That's the way the Cardinals did it forever. That, so there's, there's reason behind that. And if you look at that replay, it was still a close play. D Dansby knew what he was going to do with the ball the minute he got it and didn't hesitate and made a great throw. It was, uh, yeah, I say it was close. I mean, they beat him by like a, a foot or two, but if that throws off a little bit, he's safe. I also thought a key play in the Monday night game was Nick Madrigal in the 10th inning stealing third base. Risky, yes. man at second, but if you're going to take that chance – you better make it. And then Nico Horner comes through with the game winning hit. And David Ross after the game said, I was unaware that that was his first walk off of his career, but watching him do the interview on marquee with Taylor McGregor, I was really struck by this was a guy who was really soaking up the moment. Like this is amazing. I'm getting to be here in this position and got my first walk off. And I really like our team. It feels like, Again, Gordon, I know it is early in the season. It feels like there's a good vibe there. I would agree with that. You know, the, the issue that we've debated or, or discussed all this time has primarily been, is there enough talent? That's what's going to tell the story going forward. Is there enough talent? And then, and then there's, or is there enough health? I'll, I'll say two things off of what you just said. Um, Horner has impressed the hell out of me as, as a young player who has matured very quickly and found his uh, footing in, in the big leagues, in the clubhouse with the media, a very sharp, sharp guy. He, you see it in his game. He plays the game very smart, um, um, uh, very well. He, he uses his tool set uh, to its, to, to its maximum. Um, and, and just his demeanor, I noticed it last year. And then I, and then I noticed, actually, I noticed it at spring training last year and then saw it develop through the season. And then like another step forward, um, this year. So I'm really impressed with him. I love This is where I'll give the plaudits, right? Dansby Swanson has been so far better than I thought. And I thought he'd be good in the field. I thought he'd be really good in the field. Obviously, he's been better than I thought. Nico Horner has been, you know, as as advertised. And then some when it comes to this this demeanor and this maturity. That's a great place to start for this team. So I'll give him, you know, I'll go down the line with you and, and give um, individual, um, uh, you know, thoughts on this. The, the other thing is you talk about the Madrigal steal and we saw, we saw that Dansby play. This is how they're going to have to win. I mean, that was a two to one game in the ninth. A home run ties it. They got to go to the tenth. Bases loaded with what? One out? Correct. Or maybe no outs. One or anyway, less than two outs, and they get out of it. And then Madrigal has the steal. Now he's playing with house money because they held him scoreless in the top half. But this is how they're going to have to win. And the fact that they're being more aggressive on the bases and, and, and doing those smaller things 90 feet at a time. Um, it so far it 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 suggests that they're getting the most out of what they have and and uh and it's working so far so in looking at this team i want to talk about drew smiley for a minute his first start was not good and i thought rossi stayed with him too long allowed a big three-run home run to, to the reds broke open the game cubs lose I thought last night his depth on his curveball was the key to him being so good. I mean, as flat as I thought it was uh, against Cincinnati last night, it had some really deep bite to it. If he's good, along with Stroman and along with Justin Steele, that gives you three guys you can count on. Now you got to get Jamison Tyone going. And or Wisniewski. Look, you can afford a guy that's going to have a clunker every other time if the rest of your guys are performing or if the rest of you guys, if two guys are getting two out of three starts that are good and other guys, and then two guys are performing pretty consistently. You can afford that for this reason, right? Look who's in the wings. 
And, and look who's rehab continues to move forward at a pretty good pace. And that's Kyle Hendricks. So yeah. if he's back in, in May, you can sort some of this out with a lot of choices. Um, so right now um, I don't worry about it. And not only do I not worry about it as a, as a five man group right now, especially so early, they've only gone through the rotation twice, um, but actually not all the way twice yet either. But Marcus Stroman, Marcus Stroman hasn't allowed a run in two starts. Nor has Steele, I don't believe. Has he? I'm sorry? Justin Steele? Steele's allowed one. Maybe one. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, but but at any rate, um, Stroman is looking like, you know, the the best version of the pitcher you hope they would sign. He says, he, uh, he said uh, the WBC ramping up for that and being that competitive that early in the process this year has helped him get off to a strong start. So if that's if that holds, then it's all about him being healthy, which he wasn't all year last year. But the first half is what got him last year. Um, and so far, so good here. So then the question becomes, he's got an opt out in that contract. Okay, so if I'm Jed, and you tell me if you think I'm nuts, you usually do anyway. If I'm Jed Hoyer, okay, let's see how he's doing. And if July 1 rolls around and he is this guy, I'm not telling you he's going to be undefeated and unscored upon, but if I look at him and go, okay, I see that guy being really, really impactful, I'm going to him saying, all right, I'll tear up the last year of the deal and let's do a new three-year deal at whatever the number is. I think he... He was three for 74 the first time or thereabouts. I would three, probably yeah. three for um, nine. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that they view Stroman right now as part of their next great Cubs team. Unless that team. So they just let him walk after this season? Yeah. I mean, you can't give him. And by, and by the way, for anybody out there who who might think, well, you'll get a, you'll give him a qualifying offer. No, he's already had a qualifying offer, so uh, he can't. You can't give him one. So you would you would let him walk, or or you know, presumably you'd you'd trade him at the deadline if you don't think you're in it. Um, the thing is, the 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 money that it would take, even in the short term, they can probably apply that to something else, especially if you're if you're Dan if. <laughs> I can't even get the words out, Cap. If if your boy Otani, if they want any chance at all of uh, of uh, getting him, um, th th these are the kind of. It seems to me that these are some of the decisions they make. That they would go all in on him, and you would you would let maybe a guy so like do, him walk. So do you think if 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 they're I'm not telling you they're winning the division or going to the World Series or the pennant. If he's continuing to throw like a top of the rotation guy, leave Otani to the side for a second. If you came to him and said, okay, don't opt out and I'll add two years on your deal, two years at $60 million, $30 million a year. You don't think he would do that or you don't think they would do that? Well, that's that, that's tempting. The 30 is obviously extremely tempting if, if you're Stroman. The two is not at all because at the end of that two – what that put him in his uh he'd be he's he turns 32 years old may 1st yeah so now he's in his mid 30s and he's a look he's a good pitcher what we're seeing now is i mean he's actually got some strikeouts now um i think he's averaging 10 and a half per nine right now through those two starts so he's striking out more than you, you're used to seeing but he's a ground ball pitcher he's not overpowering you know he's he's uh, when he's on he's really really good but you go back and you look at his career and he's not He's not Justin Verlander. He's not Max Scherzer. Um, and, and so uh, I don't think he's going to continue to get paid mid-30s, late-30s at a level he wants. So if he opts out, it's going to be because he's going to try to get the most years he can, I think, uh, at that age coming off of what, what, what may be one of his better seasons. Yeah, I'm not sure that there are people lining up to give him the most years. And if he found a fit and a team where it works for him and it's a team on the come that's going, if you make the dollars right, Jason Hayward's 26 point whatever million comes off the books 
I'm giving Marcus Stroman $30 million. It's basically a wash for me financially. That shouldn't affect what I do with Otani. And let's get into that because Bob Nightingale, who you and I know very, very well, he's a good oh, man. Here we, go. here we go. Wildly connected. Bob came out and said, he's the USA Today national baseball writer, that multiple executives have told him they believe the Cubs are the sleeper team to get Shohei Otani. And one AL executive told Bob, that's my pick. I think they're getting him. Is this Jerry and Kenny? I don't know who it is. He just said an AL executive. But all I know is they have kept their powder dry. Otani has said he wants somewhere where he understands the history of the game and he wants to win. And obviously he's going to get paid. And a good friend of mine who lives in L.A. has actually done some business with Otani's group of people that manage him. They said he's not going to be the guy that says, I need the last dollar. He wants the right situation. They said, you have no idea how close the Cubs came to getting him the first time. Had there been a DH, they might have gotten him. Okay, the first time around, everybody was limited on the money. Mm -hmm. Go back and look at that. I think uh, I think he got $3 million if max. Um from the angels. It might've been less than that because every team was limited because of the, the category that he fell in as a free agent. You, you couldn't, he was an amateur. No, he was an amateur free agent. At any rate, uh, everybody was limited. Nobody could. Was that the age where he could be a complete free agent coming out of Japan? Yeah. So you couldn't get into a bona fide bidding war and pay him what he was worth. Um, so, uh, so now when you look at it, so, the dollars didn't matter when the Cubs were in that bidding war. And we know that their strength, their wheelhouse, when they're recruiting free agents is the pitch. They do, they do a great job with the videos and the, and, and the charts and spelling out the visions and, and those kind of things that they do that as well as anybody. So, um, and I'm sure they made a great pitch and I'm sure it was as close as you say. Now you say, he won't, he's not the kind of guy that might look for the last dollar. Well, what's the last dollar? The last story I saw suggested that 500 million might not do it, that it might be closer to 600 million because, because that's what he's worth. And that's what the, that, that's the kind of bidding. That's how robust it might get. Okay. So fine. So is the, is not taking the last dollar a $500 million deal? That's that's beyond anything that I think Ricketts would have an appetite for, for any player on the face of the earth, maybe any two players on the face of the earth. So I, I just don't see it happening as much as I understand and believe that the Cubs will be interested like just about any team. It'd be perfect fit. Um, the other, the other side of this equation too, is they already have Suzuki in the fold. And as we, we've talked about, you know, Suzuki, you've mentioned Suzuki's invited him and all that. That's fine. But there is a dynamic among a lot of the better Japanese players when they come over to not share that spotlight in the market they're at and the team they're on. They, they want to be the alpha dog when it comes to the star Japanese player on a team. Um, so that could be part of the dynamic too. I'll say this cap, you keep bringing this guy up. I say it ain't going to happen. You say it's possible and even maybe probable. I think we got to put some kind of some kind of wager on this. Now, I'm not saying it's a done deal by any means because there was a report out of L.A., maybe in the L.A. Times yesterday, that said 12 years, 600 million is what the contract is going to end up looking like. Look, that's the story. That, I said. That's just an obscene, insane deal. But. If this guy's at 10 and 500, I was told by someone in the marketing business who handles sports deals said he believed you could automatically count on $250 million coming back your way in international impact of jersey sales and sponsorship deals, which means you're getting it half price. Well, that's assuming that a sponsorship deal abroad doesn't displace a domestic deal. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, like where, you know, are, are you adding another billboard or are you replacing one? You know, is essentially what we're talking about. So that's part of it. And, and merchandising for sure. Yeah. Okay. I tell you what, Cap, if, if this happens, 
the first podcast we do after this, the second one, because first podcast we do be an emergency podcast, right? right? If this happens, the second podcast we do after it happens, I'll spend the entire effing podcast saying nothing but positive things about the Cubs brass, the ownership. I, I'll come up with everything I can think of that's a nice thing to say about the Cubs. I won't rip them for anything for an entire effing podcast. How about this? If it happens, I will write a manifesto you have to read about Cubs management and about the Cubs organization. Okay. And if it doesn't happen, you've got, okay, you've at least, you've at least got to wear a Cardinals hat for, for two episodes. I will wear a Cardinals jersey and hat for now, an you can't have it. You can't say Contreras on it and it can't be his number. Why not? It'll say that nope, stupid nope, bird on the nope, bat thing. Nope, nope, nope. You pick the Cardinal jersey, I'll wear it. Yachty. Oh, God. I can't stand that guy. Uh, okay. Deal. All right. Game on. Uh, all right. Cubs will go to L.A. And then I believe the San Diego. They've got some tough, tough games coming up. Your thoughts as they head out west? Well, we're going to see the first test, right? And the, and the Dodgers aren't what they were maybe the last couple of years. But instead of being a 111-win team, maybe they'll be a 100-win team this year. But I think that's the first test. I tell you what, watch watch the games, listen to the games uh, when they're out in L.A. But I'm, I'm I, I, look, I'm already going to say nice things about the Cubs, right? If you can get a ticket at, at a decent price, go when they come back in town because they got a homestand that's got seven straight games against the, the Dodgers and the Padres later this month. That right there is going to tell you, it's going to be the first real message signal that tells you something about this team this year. It, you know, it's not going to tell the whole story of the season, but it'll give you the first real indication. It'll be a benchmark of where are they at the end of that two series with with both of those clubs. All right, Gordon, have a great rest of your day. Cubs and Mariners and then Cubs off to L.A. So we'll have another podcast drop next week, and they hope that Saya will be back on Friday night in Los Angeles. Have a great day, man. All right, you too.